In this video, I'm going to take you through a full house plumbing installation. And this house is kind of unusual. Never had gas, never had wet central heating system. An existing hot water system has been completely taken out. So we are dealing with a blank canvas. And what we are doing, we're putting a new gas supply, new mains water supply, new wet central heating system based on a gas boiler, and a new unvented cylinder. The gas supply has been already laid and run through the cellar. We're waiting for British gas to connect the meter and we have to put our water supply here in the trench as well. So right here we've got a new gas supply and that's where the new gas meter will go and I have to run my supply from roughly here back to the boiler that will go on the first floor. This is what is going to be a future bathroom and that's where the boiler will go with unvented cylinder. The loft is getting converted as well so once the property is fully renovated it will have two bathrooms and three bedrooms. What we are installing here is a system that will outperform any combi on the market including storage combis. What we're gonna do we're gonna install a small cylinder and a 30 kilowatt combination boiler from Intergas used as a system boiler and it also can do hot water priority on our cylinder. The cylinder we're installing is going to be a high gain cylinder so it can take a large load of 30 kilowatts for full hot water uh, reheat and we're gonna be able to reheat the cylinder from 10 degrees to 50 degrees in 11 and a half minutes and if you think about it if you use one shower at 10 liters a minute you will never run out of hot water comparable to combi. Not only that, we're going to be able to use two showers at the same time and using full flow rate coming on the mains to the cylinder. So I've got a boiler on the wall and partially piped up. Flue is done as well. And now I have to, before I put the cylinder in place, I have to pressure test my pipe work on central heating, pressure test my pipe work on hot and cold supplies, and also test my gas because it's all gonna be behind the cylinder and once I install it if there is any problems behind the cylinder it just would be a lot of work to take the cylinder out however I have no gas at the property because British Gas has not provided uh, a meter yet I've run a new water supply but it's yet to be connected by Thames water so that's again not life yet and obviously without gas and water I can't test central heating either so that's all of my pipe work going to the floor above where the boiler is. This is my new gas supply going all the way here where the meter will go. Right here, that's a new supply, mains water supply, blue MDP, uh, insulated. And in here you have stopcock, double check valve and a drain point. And I have to test the gas somehow. On the gas, I've put gas isolating valve with a test point open end in 10 mil on the other side so I can connect the hose, pressurize the pipe work to 20 millibar and test it on the valve test point with air. Turn the valve off. As you can see we've got 28 millibars so we can drop it off slightly. That's good enough. As you can see the installation is tight, no movement on the gauge at all. My hot on the right is linked to the main supply on the left. Now I will go downstairs and pressure test hot and cold at the same time. As soon as the water comes out we can turn this valve off because we know the air is purged and we can pressure test it. Now I'm going to repeat the same test on central heating linking flow and return under the boiler and pumping water through one of the pipes going to one of the radiators. Right, that's ready. That's probably the only good use for push-fit fittings. Push-fit cups and testing. Same story as before, I'm gonna connect to one of the pipes. Take the cap off from the other pipe and purge the air. So now I'm just waiting till I get water coming out from the open pipe. Oh, there's water coming out, we can cap it off. I've got my central heating pipe pressurized to 5 bar and so far no leaks. As soon as this test is over, I'm ready to start installing the cylinder upstairs.
All the pipe work behind the cylinder is now ready so I can put the cylinder in place and hopefully it will fit. I only have two elbows left and I don't want to be soldering because it's almost 4 o'clock Friday. You don't want to leave site after you just finished soldering. Actually, I think my insurance says I have to stop soldering two hours before the work finishes. So three o'clock is the end of soldering. So two elbows left. I have to do some pipe bending, flex some bending because I don't have more fittings. So what I'm gonna do, flow to the cylinder, 190 degree bend, second 90 degree bend, third 90 degree bend, three bends on one pipe. If you do only 90 degree bends, it's actually not that difficult to measure it accurately. Yeah, I said that now and probably I'll just have a ton of scrap before I manage to pull that one off. That's my second bend right there. What's the most important thing right now is to make sure that where the mark is, I'm at the right angle to the guide. Right angle, right here on my mark. Now, the second important thing, I need to get them at the right angles. That's about right. Okay, now the moment of truth. Let's have a look. And this is my last bend, and I need to get it right, because if I bend it wrong, this whole thing is scrap. So, I'm marking bottom of this pipe, right here, or where I want this mark, somewhere here. Right, this is really crucial to get this one right. I'm happy with that, let's do it. Let's get it in. This is good. So there you have it. If you run out of 90 degree fittings and you only have 90s to do on one length of pipe, it's not impossible to bend one, two, three, three or four bends. It's actually quicker than soldering, but it's probably slower than press fitting. So it's been eight weeks since I last been here and the progress has been really slow. Here I've got my gas meter already installed and I've reconnected the gas and mains water is already reconnected out on the street as well. So our services in the cellar are completed. I haven't tested the flow yet, but the owner said be careful because he called it insane. So the biggest changes have happened in the bathroom. I think the client built the partitioning himself. So he built this partitioning and partitioning here around the boiler cupboard and boxing for the toilet and boxings for showers. And in here I've got a boiler to wire up. What I'm doing here is diverter valve. So that valve is normally open to central heating. Nest running on open therm. Central heating is just one zone because this uh, house, even with the loft conversion, I think it's still under 100 square meters. It's quite small. And when there is a call for heating, Nest fires the boiler on open, on open therm and the valve is in its resting position. The valve is not activated, central heating works uh, without any power going to any valves, and that's it, simple. When there is call for hot water, however, the valve moves to open the flow to the cylinder and it blocks the heating. And then the boiler fires up uh, on a predetermined preset kilowatt output and also predetermined uh, flow temperature. And because it's a small cylinder, what I found, it's only 125 liters. Using small cylinders with big boilers, this is 30 kilowatts, I found that I was getting a lot of stratification in the cylinder if the boiler was running too hot. Meaning that there was a really, really hot water on the top of the cylinder reaching 70 degrees, while the lower one third was 60. It's nice to have a cylinder really close to the boiler and that would allow me to run the flow to the cylinder at 65 degrees or maybe even lower, I'm gonna experiment with it. So that I actually don't have a very hot water on the top of the cylinder and it doesn't become dangerous because on the bath, the client requested non-thermostatic controls on the bath, just a regular mixer. They do like really hot baths and it does annoy them if there is a thermostatic mixing going to the bath. What's also interesting is that for controlling my hot water I'm gonna use a 10k NTC sensor that's wired back to the boiler 
it does boiler the actual temperature of the uh, cylinder and we're using a high limit step that has three connections come on one and two because we are using NTC if the NTC contact is fully open it means the boiler has a demand for uh, hot water or it reads the NTC temperature if we've got a continuity between uh, NTC connections the boiler reads that as cylinder satisfied so this little stat if, it, if the cylinder overheats, it needs to close the connection, not break the connection. And that close connection will prevent the boiler from uh, firing. If the temperature in the store goes over 80 degrees, the connection common and one will make contact and will prevent the boiler from firing. And also we wire our NTC to common and one, so when the uh, overheat high limit stat does not make the connection, the boiler reads the temperature of the store from common and from one. And I'll show you how it's wired in a second, uh, because the NTC will go where the sensor, where this bulb sensor is on this high limit stat. And that's what you get when the high limit stat and NTC are fully wired. It's nice to zip ties those together though, so they're in the same position. So I can put my cover on now. So now we've got high limit stat and the cylinder sensor connected on a single twin core wire and that wire will go straight back to the boiler to the connection for the cylinder sensor. Connection 5 and 4 on the block X13 on that boiler. When there is demand for hot water the boiler provides switched life for our diverter valve to close off the heating port and open the port going to the cylinder. And that connection is again on a uh, 230 volt side of the PCB on the boiler and that's this little connection here, plug X4. All the wiring's completed now so let me show you what I've done at the boiler PCB at the wiring center at that, the nest before I close it all up. So on the nest you've got uh, neutral and live to power the nest, connection 4 and 5 for hot water so normally closed and common and open therm going to the boiler for heating. That's all the connections here. On the wiring center you've got just a switch light from the boiler for the zone valve. That could have been wired straight back to the boiler the, and the supply to the nest and that's everything on 230 volts and then this is the other side of the wiring center which is a volt free connection which has a NTC programmer from nest with on a volt free connection an open therm going back to the boiler. That's all on the wiring center. On the boiler itself we've got connection 5 and 4 right here which is NTC from the hot water cylinder and a high limit stat from the cylinder and also nest connection for hot water to time it. And those two is open therm and then there's a switched live to operate a diverter valve coming from the boiler and it operates the diverter valve once there is a uh, hot water demand. Let's turn it on. Right, the boiler's on. Nest has power, hydroflow has power. So now we have to set the kilowatt output for heating and we're going right down to the absolute minimum we can set on this boiler, which is, I think it's 25%, 25% of 24 kilowatts. Yeah, that is six kilowatts exactly and that's what we need at this house and 30 kilowatts for hot water on this tiny cylinder. So in a way we've created a big storage combi. We're gonna have a uh, flow of 20 liters a minute at 60 degree uh, stored water. And that boiler will be able to recharge that cylinder almost as a combi boiler would do at the flow rate of uh, of whatever a 30 kilowatt combi boiler would give you. So I think it's around 11 liters a minute at Delta T35. It's not the best day today to test temperatures because it's supposed to be 40 degrees outside, the hottest day ever, I think, in UK. So the, my main water is 23 degrees. Okay, so here it goes. If we want to heat the cylinder to 60 degrees and the incoming mains is 23, we need to raise the water by 37 degrees. We know that one liter of water 
to be raised by one degree needs 4.18 kilojoules. Multiply it by 120 liters in the cylinder. Multiply by 37 degrees delta T, so the raise of temperature in the cylinder. Divided by 30 kilowatts the boiler can provide. That gives us 618.64 seconds. Divide that, divide that by 60. The cylinder should be heated up to 60 degrees in 10 minutes, 31 seconds. So well, let's test it. Let's turn it on and time it. Eight minutes in, the return, return from the cylinder is 55 degrees. We should be reaching the store temperature now. Because the return comes on the bottom, that's close to the pocket. And the delta V is nice and wide. 15 degrees, 16 degrees now. Come on, little boiler. Look at how hot it gets. So that's obviously not safe, not acceptable. I have to keep adjusting this whole setup till it's safe to use. In principle, really, it's like a big storage combi, 30 kilowatt storage combi with 125 liters of stored water. So if you use one bathroom, one shower, you pretty much never run out of hot water. If you use two showers, you've got 125 liters of stored water at 60 C, and then the boiler kicks in to reheat the water. So you might get maybe, maybe 18, maybe 20 minutes of two showers being used simultaneously so you get a performance much better than any combi could give you because the biggest combi 40 kilowatts not only it's a monster it requires big 28 mil uh, pipe work and it's expensive it can only provide about 14 15 liters a minute at 35 degree temperature rise not at 40 or 45 degree temperature rise so that provides a way better hot water performance uh, now i have to wait for the plasters to do their work decorators and i'll come back to fit the radiators so there'll be a part two this video coming in the near future.